All right, so you guys like to get uh, project analysis from time to time, and we like to do that for you. We'll dive deep into projects, understand what they're really up to, and really kind of connect the dots of what this might mean for Web3 or the future of blockchain in general. Today's no different. We're going to do that exact thing and talk to HiveMapper and dive into the Solana blockchain, but really how this might change mapping, but also many other use cases. It's going to be a fun one. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. Joining me today is Mr. Ariel Seedman, who is the CEO and co-founder over at Hive Mappers. Great to have you on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Ariel, so let's get into it. For some of our audience, I think most of our audience follow us enough to know when we do big breakdowns. Uh, when Solana Breakpoint occurred last year, we got a chance to really showcase Hive Mapper for the first time. Uh, I saw it as one of the big breakthroughs of potentially Web3 applications in the future. For some of our readers and listeners and viewers that maybe just joined in on the conversation, give us a quick rundown on what HiveMapper really is aiming to do. Sure. Um, so we're trying to create a new global map, right? Um, they're really, you know, the dominant map that everybody uses for the most part today is Google Maps, right? There's about two and a half billion users who use it in terms of every day on their Android or iPhone device. Uh, and then there's about four to five million businesses who use it integrated into their products, right? So right. you think about Uber uses it, Yelp uses it, the US government uses Google Maps, um, you know, weather applications use Google Maps. And so we, we think that there needs to be competition in this market. We need to focus on making sure that we cover the entire world, right? Not just places like LA and London, uh, in Miami and San Francisco, we need to also cover places like Manila and Lagos, Nigeria and Sao Paulo at that same level of quality that we cover Los Angeles and London today. So what we're trying to do basically is create this incredibly fresh map that all of us are kind of helping build. Okay, so how does yeah. it work? You buy this dash cam and then you install the dash cam, it takes maybe five to 10 minutes to install the dash cam. It looks like every other dash cam you've ever seen in the world, but it is specialized for mapping. And it has some technologies in that dash cam that are really great for mapping use cases and mapping purposes. And then once you have the dash cam installed, you can use it as a dash cam, but it's also providing map data that we're using that then we take all that imagery that is coming off that dash cam and we turn it into great map data. But you're just driving, you're just driving like you yeah. normally would. We're not asking you to do anything special. Uh, you know, there's billions of cars on the road and we're just trying to come along for the ride in, in some subset of those cars so that we can build this great map. Yeah, cool. All right, so first of all, when you look at the TAM uh, for what this industry is and could be, you know, from whether it's map data or feeding back into different um, you know, use cases that both Apple Maps, Google Maps, et cetera, have, have already kind of, I guess, cornered the market on to a certain extent. Uh, outside of Tesla, I mean, maybe, maybe they're the ones that have the most miles on it. I'm not sure in comparison between those two titans out yeah. there. But is, is there a big demand for mapping solutions outside what we already see you know, on our phones and in our desktops today? Yeah. So there's kind of two main customers of map data, right? There's human beings, right? Like you and I, who are basically building this data or sorry, using this data for turn by turn navigation to looking up a pizza shop or a sushi or whatever. But that next generation of customers is actually cars, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get into a car, the car itself is now starting to use map data. So a very simple example would be speed limit data. So every new um, right. European car made now has to have speed limit data integrated into the car itself, right? Um, and so this is a, a new regulation that's coming. Now you have the, um, solutions like ADAS, which is basically assisted driving. Okay, how do I navigate you onto the highway? How do I maintain you in that lane? Well, you got to know how many lanes are on the highway, right? You need to know, okay, if I want to get off, where's the next exit, right? I need to know how many lanes are they get off the exit all this incredibly detailed information will start to be consumed by the car itself. So that is a very nascent market, um, but it's huge, right? Because you're talking about ultimately billions of cars starting to consume this map data. For sure. So yeah, I think the other thing to remember is like, look, you know, if you use Google Maps 10 years ago um, or many other mapping applications 10 years ago, 
that thing was not frequently updated, right? It was maybe updated every 18, 24 months. You fast forward now, if you're dealing with a map that's only updated 18, 24 months, it is a bad map or it's considered a bad map, right? Right. But expectations of just people like us is always increasing for fresher maps, higher quality maps, more accurate maps, and that will never stop. Yeah, I think the comparison now, if you look at, um, you know, the industry as it is, you look at, you know, what, what out there today is providing, I guess, a better use case. I would only probably default to Tesla just because of the amount of cars that they've got on the road, the amount of miles that they've driven. Um, you know, I use uh, and, and drive a couple of Teslas. Yeah. And one thing I'm, I'm noticing more and more is how integrated their mapping system is versus Google Maps when I do yeah. a cross comparison, because I'll have the navigation over here with Tesla and then the navigation over here with Waze or Google Maps. There's a clear yeah. difference between it. Now, I'm yeah. assuming that they're flipping all this stuff through Dojo and they're, you know, constantly uh, labeling and improving and all those kind of things. I'm finding now that the Tesla map is actually better than my Google map that I'm getting, yeah. which is updated, I thought, almost immediately, especially on traffic. Real-time traffic is another big problem. Uh, yeah. I know they're using, you know, some calculations against that. Yeah. When you look at the the amount of miles that, I would say Tesla could be your only competitor. I mean, I don't know that Google Maps would be in the future because if you get to critical mass, you yeah. know, and how many cars on the planet are there, you yeah. know, versus electrical cars, you know, Tesla's still a fraction of the marketplace. Yeah. What, what would it look like for you guys in the next 10 years? What do you think your ramp to acceleration is for yeah. mapping data? So look, so if you look, we, we launched this project in November, Okay, so the first four months, it took us four months to get a million unique road kilometers. There's about 60 million road kilometers in the world. Um, so it took us four months to get one million, and then it took us four weeks to get the next million, right? So our growth is actually accelerating, um, and we'll continue to see that in the coming months is that we'll just be able to like map more and more and more. You you know, you can show your viewers the, the explorers to like where this yep. coverage starting to occur, which is really cool and fun to see. But I would say in terms of, you know, competition is like, look, Tesla will certainly be very good and comprehensive and fresh in places like New York, in places like Miami, in places like San Francisco, right? But if you go to South America, right, or if you, even if you go to certain parts of America, they will have practically no coverage, right? And that has a lot to do with just the kinds of cars that they sell at the price points that they sell. So the car manufacturers, while they're, you know, they have a hard job, right? Building cars is not easy. Um, no single car manufacturer will ever have enough global coverage, okay? In order to build like a truly global map. And what that means is in order to build a truly global map, the car manufacturers will have to share data with one another. Yeah. Yeah. But they're competing with one another, right? Like Tesla and Ford are competing with one another, you know, they're competing with Toyota and they're competing with, you know, Audi and BMW. That's the last thing that they want to do is actually share data. So, you know, if you go talk to the car manufacturers, many of them will say, look, we should have built Google Maps. We should have built Waze. Well, that's like 15 years ago, <laughs> yeah. with all due respect. And so, look, their business model demands that they ship cars, that they sell cars. That's really hard. Right, which is very, very different than focusing on global coverage and comprehensiveness in all the types of things that mapping companies need to do. So I, I personally don't view them as competition. I view them as partners. So, OK, so the, I see this uh, a couple of angles here that could really explode for Hive Mapper, uh, but also could could represent some stumbling blocks as well. If you look at the devices, I was looking at your your dash cam and then your dash cam S uh, here, and I look at that. So that that's good in the sense of hey, there's a pop there's an opportunity. We'll talk about how earning can be done here in a second. But you know, potentially, if you had OEM partnerships with some of the manufacturers and you're integrating these devices into you know true dash cams, which I'm seeing more and more companies or uh, cars coming out with dash cams just because of what Tesla has been doing in, in trying to integrate mapping, but more importantly for self-driving. Because that, that's really the tool, you know, when you look at, at Tesla's real purpose, the cameras yeah. are there to do one thing, learn how to drive. Um, 
the alternative is that you could collect map data and be much more real time. With that being the case, are you working on any OEM partnerships right now with manufacturers around the world where you could just integrate this technology in every new car? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, short version is not yet, right? Like I think they will start to take us more and more seriously as we have more coverage. We're approaching that, right? We have 2 million unique road kilometers right now. We're growing. So obviously they're taking notice of kind of what we're doing here. So step one, and you showed those prices over there, there's one at 550 and there's another one at 650. Yeah. Look, this first generation products, um, the history of all hardware technology is, is that the price comes down over time. Sure. And so you know, hopefully for sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so hopefully next year we provide, you know, one or our partners provide one, which is lower cost. And so it makes it available to even more people, right? If you look at places like India and you look at places like South America, obviously in those markets, you know, a two hundred dollar dash cam or two hundred fifty dollar dash cam would really dramatically open up those markets. And, and we fully yeah. recognize that and appreciate that. Um, and then, yes, longer term, integrating and working with the car manufacturers is certainly interesting. Um, and so I think it will always be working with many different car manufacturers, right? It won't be a, it's not a silver bullet. Yeah. Explain to me how the tech works. So I've got, I've got one of these dash cams on my, on my car. Uh, is this uh, integrated into my mobile device as far as uh, being able to transmit the data? I'm assuming Bluetooth or something of that nature. Yeah, yeah exactly. So you, uh, you install the dash cam and then you can just drive and then it will drive like you don't have to be connected to your iphone or android device so we have an app called the high mapper app uh, on for ios as well as for android you download that app um you set it up you can actually look at like what is exactly what the dash cam is seeing so you can mount it properly and all that kind of stuff um and then but then you can just drive you don't you do not have to be connected to the dash cam 100 percent of the time uh we there's enough storage on the actual dash cam to drive for roughly eight to 10 hours. And at that point you do need to sync to your phone. And then from your phone, okay. either you can <coughs> tell you through Wi-Fi. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. So that's good. So uh, easy enough to on and offload the data that's coming in from that. What's the difference between these two, the two devices? Cause one looks obviously quite a bit sexier than the other. One a bit much bigger yeah. is what is there a field of view or what what is this what, what's the difference so there's if you're like an uber driver or a lyft driver and you want a dash cam that has a lot of like insurance capabilities and safety capabilities then the hive mapper dash cam s and that s stands for security it does have some additional features and capabilities which will make that easier to use as a, a true dash cam for security purposes. Okay. Um, the original, from a mapping perspective, it's effectively exactly the same, right? You're not gonna yeah. earn more tokens with one or the other. Yeah, interesting. I mean, that looks like the Elgato camera to me. <laughs> There's one of those out there. All right, so you've got some other options here. Uh, don't have a car, no problem. You've got uh, the capability of doing software training now. So that's, yeah. that's a big deal. Uh, and yeah. even going into the annotating map potentially coming later. So other additional yeah. feature sets, you know, within the technology itself. Let's let's leap over. Uh, first of all, when would the map editor, what's your roadmap wise of seeing that come to fruition? So right now, if you go to hypemapper.com backslash trainers, you can and you, you do not have to have a car. You can be anywhere in the world. Um, you could be mapping and tr effectively training the map AI. So what does that mean? That means is that you're basically confirming or validating that the AI is correctly seeing the world. So okay. our AI, is, okay, that's a speed. We think that's a speed limit sign of 25 miles an hour. Is that accurate, right? Mm -hmm. We think this is a um, intersection traffic light, right? We think that this, you know, we think there's a highway exit sign for highway exit sign. And so you as a map AI trainer are basically confirming and validating that or telling the AI, no, 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 you got it wrong. Right. Yeah. And so you're earning honey tokens by doing that. And like I said, you can do it anywhere in the world. You can do it from a mobile device or from a computer desktop. Okay. So let's talk about the honey tokens real quickly. 
you know, uh, first of all, how much honey is, say, the, ma- the average mapper right now generating? Do you guys have like a, a threshold here that's happening? Yeah. So on the driver side, so if you buy the dash cam, you saw the dash cam and you're driving, it does vary by region. But the average right now is about 1,200 honey tokens per week. OK. OK. So um, what's the token um, worth right now? I don't know. I think it's on. It's on one. I think it's on one of these decentralized exchanges. I don't check it. Um, okay. But you, you can very quickly go find it. You know, there's uh, an, all right. So all we can do- compare. Yeah. I mean, uh, there, there, so, there's a lot okay. of these earn earn to use type platforms. Uh, you, if you look at H and T, you know, from what Helium yeah. has done, many of those kinds of formats that have been a little bit more complicated and actually delivering, you know, uh, a result to the person yeah. who's doing it, especially when you have a device involved, because it looks, yeah. this feels a lot like the minor aspect of yeah. what Helium yeah. was trying to do. We've yeah. put some Helium devices in our studio here. Um, we probably should get one of these and test it out just to kind of see um, how this works in terms of the, the you know, the integration. Uh, are you doing real-time earning right now where Honey is basically earned as it's mapped? Uh, no, so you you see your earnings on a weekly basis. And so there is some nuance here, which I think is important for your viewers to understand, which is it's very dependent upon how your region is progressing, right? So what does that mean? So look, if you're sitting in a region, a place in the world where you're the only mapper, right? Yeah. That it is very likely that that region is ever going to become valuable to a customer, right? And so it's really and bring your friends and family along useful people helping build this map together. And at that point, you're actually going to earn more honey tokens. Okay. Because we're saying, right. we're seeing like, oh, wow, this region is actually progressing. It's progressing nicely and it will likely be valuable to customers. And so, so it's going to leverage up against, based on the density of the mappers. Exactly. Okay, so that's yeah. that's the opposite of like what the miners were doing because as it got more dense, there was less being distributed out to the miners. What you're saying is, as the density increases, there would be more value to the network. So, there, so there is a threshold, right? There's like there's like um the the way to think about it is like there's too few mappers. That's bad, right? Okay. So that's what I'm saying. Is like you're the only person if there's only yep. three of you in the region. That's bad. But certainly, yes, like if you go to like a place like L.A. and there's 10,000 people, Mm -hmm. you know, that 10,000 first person isn't going to earn very much. Okay, all right. So So there is a density threshold. Okay. what what would it take for you to to really map a a major area? I mean, and again, this gets back to kind of the thing that, you know, Google had a problem with in the early mapping days, uh, which was you only had good quality maps in the major cities, you know. Yeah. Um, it took yeah. a long time to kind of fill in the blanks. And when I go back to your Explorer, this was kind of interesting to me. I mean, granted, here in the U.S., you've got uh, mostly what looks to be major uh, interstates and thoroughfares, um, dense, you know, typical places, New York, Chicago, some in, you know, down here in Florida, which is w- weird that it's not, well, I guess it is fairly, but interesting. I guess that's Orlando. Uh, but when you look over in Europe, this was a, uh, what happened right here? Explain this little area right here. I was looking in the UK and yeah. there's like this hard line right there. What happened? Is this like a no fly zone for something? <laughs> no, I, I just think it's the map tiles not loading properly. So I think oh, okay. that's actually just, right. that's just a software bug. If you refresh the browser, I think it'll come through uh, or you zoom in. Um, so, the, um, yeah, Norwich. a little software, yeah. a little software glitch there. Okay, all right. Well, this is this is cool. Again, centralized mostly in the UK and the US. Um, what is the roadmap for you guys to grow at scale? Are you looking at certain uh, geographic regions, whether it's Pak Rim or the Middle East, yeah. uh, India, especially? I would think would be a big one. Um, yeah, at least in critical mass of being able to get enough d- devices out there and start really rolling w- with it. Yeah. Is there what's next on your on your hit list? Yeah. So, I mean, look, we're, we're growing uh, eight times faster than Google Street View is or sorry, that Google Street View did in the early days. So I think we're growing already incredibly quickly. Um, the, 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 the map is growing exponential. Um, you know, can it grow faster? Absolutely. But we're really focused on specific regions across the world. Right. Like if you just say, okay, you know, let's say 12 months I come back on your show, Paul, 
and I got like 100 million not I, the, the community has built 100 million uh, road kilometers, yeah. I would much prefer, right, or it'd be much more valuable to customers if those 100 million road kilometers were actually mapped in specific regions, then kind of just spread out all over the world. And okay. so we're very yeah, focused so on that. Density. We're very, very focused on that. Exactly. Yeah. So like places like the Netherlands, places like Portugal, um, places like uh, South Korea is growing very quickly. Why Netherlands and Portugal? What What's so critical about those two countries? We know that there's customer demand there. Okay, demand. All right. Okay. And then as far as the uh, the aspect of the chain selection, obviously, I mean, I think yeah. I know why you chose Solana, but what, what was your reason? So I'm not a crypto guy and I'm not like religious about, you know, L1 blockchains. And I just kind of looked at the landscape and said, okay, what is the most cost effective blockchain, right? Because the way I look at it is, you know, once we have 50,000, 80,000 contributors driving around all over the world, I doubt that that like, you know, 80,000 contributor will ever uh, know what blockchain we're on and will even care. Care, right? yeah, they, sure. And so I look at it as like they running a business. They just want their honey. Right, exactly. They just want their honey and they just want to go quickly. And so, you know, I look at it as like, what is the most cost effective uh, blockchain? And it was very clear to me that Solana was fixated on that. Yeah, right? yeah like, for sure. Their cost is low. And so, What about integration into like Phantom and stuff like that? I mean, Phantom is really moving quickly in terms of development. A lot of opportunity here. What do you think? I mean, we use Phantom. Um, it's a great wallet. It's a great user experience. Uh, so, you know, when you sign up for a Hive Mapper, you do use Phantom. Um, it's very secure. So we, we have no issue with it. We like it. And it's uh, it's been a, they've been a great partner to us. A couple of questions here on uh, devices. So you've got your devices that you're selling. So I don't know if you're more of a device company or software company. Would the potential or to be able to just go to a map and a camera or even to a GoPro or something like that that has Bluetooth, Bluetooth connectivity or at least data transfer capability? Um, because you're saying you offload that data, whether it's Bluetooth or even if you did, did a little you know, cable. My question is, is could there be other, technolo other camera technology being used for somebody that already has these? Because I, I would think that would be yeah. really fast for, yeah. you know, for adoption? Yes, it's a really good question. So look, I'm, I tried that, right? In other words, I tried building a great map with like iPhone devices and GoPro devices and Android devices. Yeah. And there's a couple of issues. One is that the positional accuracy, right, is not high quality enough to build a when really good map. When you say positional accuracy in the camera view, field of view or in the GPS data? In the GPS data. Okay, right. GPS. Okay. So, so it, you know, the camera will be located on on a highway, and you know, it'll actually tell you that you're like on a service road off the highway, right? Okay. That's, right. That's well, like, welcome to Tesla. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. that that that's called positional accuracy, and so that's the underlying GPS or GNSS in the actual hardware itself. And so, I mean, look, iPhone and Android devices and GoPro devices, they're not designed for the purposes right. of mapping. So the, okay. so one, that's the first issue. The second issue yeah. is that the camera quality has to be appropriate for actually mapping and capturing the edges, right? So you don't yeah. want just the street, you want the street signs and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, field of view is going to be critical there for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then the okay, third all right. issue. You sold me on the hardware. I, I can agree with so, those, those points for sure. <laughs> what about, so okay, other, so... The Go last, ahead, last I think, part yeah. is, um, is location verification, right? The whole, you will get spoofed, right? Once you integrate rewards, people will try to spoof their location. Uh, for sure. And That's so what you, was my next question. You, the scammers oh, nice. are going to be out in force. <laughs> yeah. So inside of the high mapper dash cam is a piece of hardware, multiple layers of hardware that ensures location verification so that we yeah. And more, more importantly, that customers can trust that if somebody said that they were mapping in Venice, California, they were actually in Venice, California, and not like Topeka, Kansas, or someplace in Brazil, right? Okay. Uh, and we tried this with third-party devices. Man, did we get spoofed and scammed and all that type of stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah, I could see that being the case, with especially 
Yeah, I mean, you know, the technology and the capability uh, is getting so advanced now with a lot of this. Okay, so you're doing road or street level data right now, but why not aerial data? You know, you look at Google Earth, what's been done there. Drones yeah. are obviously an opportunity here that you could see commercial activity go into this direction. Any yeah. potential going in that direction of getting aerial mapping, mapping going? Not, not in the foreseeable, like not in the next year or two. Uh, beyond that, who knows? Look, I think drones are really interesting. We actually started with drones, but we put this to the side because the battery technology didn't improve, and there was a lot of yeah. government regulation and stuff like that. So I'm, you know, there's still a there's still a warm and fuzzy part in my heart for drones. Uh, but the, the underlying technology still needs to evolve quite a bit, and hopefully it does, and then we would look at it again, certainly. All right, I'm going to hit on a few questions here that I've got uh, just to kind of round this up. Um, all right, first of all, what companies are you, can you give us any big name company that's using your data yet? Uh, there are some, but I, I'm not, I can't share them. Oh, come on, give me, yeah, give me one. I wish I could. I wish I could. <laughs> Um, you know, so, so yes, there are, and there's now many more data evaluation projects where customers well, are Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. For companies, if I, I have a big company, I need a mapping solution. What, what's going to be my core, your core selling proposition to them for somebody saying, okay, Hive Mapper, we want to, we don't write you a check because we want that API or want access to your data. What, what's like the core thing that they're interested in today? Freshness. So that all means right, so is that we, accuracy, clean, clean maps, accuracy. Okay. All right. We're updating a lot more frequently. Like we're seeing locations, you know, you know, 25, 50 times more frequently than Google all right. Street View. Then you can just say it. Uber is your biggest customer. <laughs> I'm just saying it. Uber is your biggest customer. They're the ones that are going to need this data the, the most freshest. At least that would be the ones I want. Uber and Lyft, whoever has this, I mean, if it's accurate, why not go ahead and roll this out into the Uber fleet or the the Lyft fleets, uh, into the Postmate fleets that are out there doing all these deliveries, you know, and just, you Absolutely. know, just bam, hit these markets. We don't know exactly what percentage of the current drivers are Uber drivers or Lyft drivers. We think it's like a 30 to 40 percent of the people who are driving are Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Amazon Flex drivers, all those yeah. kinds of people. So effectively the gig yeah. drivers and they're really important and they're great and they're you know there's also truck drivers now coming into the community as well so um you know those people who are out on the road six seven eight hours a day you know a they like it from an earning a honey perspective but i think there's even something more to it which is i think that there's a sense of entertainment and accomplishment right uh, all of a sudden the day you're gamification like, oh, wow. there yeah yeah for sure. so i mapped this entire area like you're building something, right? Everybody has a creative bug in them. And so you got a leaderboard? Is there a leaderboard out leader. there? But you can see, I mean, okay. you can look at the map and be like, wow, I built that entire thing. You know, that's yeah. me or I contributed to that. That's pretty cool. We will do some of that type of stuff in the future, but it's not currently the, the highest priority for us. Well, this is what you have look, to look forward to. This is the kind of mapping data that's coming in from Tesla right now. Uh, if you look at these kinds of numbers, but based on just autopilot miles and then just what they're grabbing for their dojo, which is their feedback loop for, may, mostly this came from the Lex Friedman podcast where he was an, analyzing the potential for robo taxis and then kind of that yeah. that future technology here. Pretty short, but big ramp ups all the way up to 2021. If you look at that curve and what this yeah. could look like in the next decade, oh my gosh, this is going to be huge in terms of mile yeah. accumulation. Obviously, Tesla's continue to go in that. My last question to you is what stops Tesla, Ford, GM, one of the big makers, Volvo, Mercedes, anybody from just saying, let's do the same thing? What would keep them from doing that? Well, they're always, look, they're, any car manufacturer is going to have coverage in certain parts of the world, right? But as a global map provider, right, serving the entire world or serving customers all over the world, you really got to focus on ensuring coverage in every little town, every little, you know, big cities and small cities and medium sized cities. And so that is, you know, the primary objective of a mapping company. If you're Ford, you don't care if you sell more cars in California or more cars in Texas, right? Actually, it's probably easier for you to sell more cars in California and Texas and versus the rest of the part of the, the, the world or the country. 
And so that's just not where your business model is taking you, right? right. Whereas our yeah. business model is taking us, no, no, no. We need to make sure that we have coverage everywhere. Well, and so I there don't are know, though. I don't know, because a, a, a car manufacturer is going to, at, at some point, we're going to get to autonomous vehicles. And whoever has the best, freshest maps for that autonomy engine, whether it's AI driven or, you know, machine learning or just, you know, physical, you know, mapping, much like what you're doing with people, yeah. you know, going in and kind of checking, you know, the boxes. Those are going to be the winners in a decade from now. That, that, yeah. that is the winner. Whoever has that best map. So I think you guys are onto something in the sense of the yeah. value of the map is going to be huge, especially with autonomous delivery autonomous you know autonomous vehicles in general and we're going to get there people whether it's regulation whether it's this decade or the next it's going to happen for sure ariel it's been great uh talking to you ariel seaman who is the ceo and co-founder over at hive mapper so thanks for coming out today we appreciate it thank you for having me you bet all right so you guys are maybe listening on the podcast side of things uh, jump over here to the youtube channel because you're going to get a chance to see we just did a video here that showed you a lot of interaction of how some of these Web3, Web2 to Web3 projects are starting to roll out. There is a lot of visualization to this, so sometimes the podcast doesn't do it for you. Make sure and get us uh, over here on YouTube. Just search Paul Bear Network. You'll find us. And of course, if you're not in our Diamond Circle, get in. It's free, and it's the best place to catch additional information. I do a podcast over there, additional research. We'll drop even more research in there on this very show. So of course, all you have to do is click the link down below. If you want to catch me, it's going to be at one place out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.